Uh, well, I'm just going to start by asking, how does How to Train Your Dragon 2 differ from How to Train, Train Your Dragon 1? Well, I, as a huge fan of the first film, thought it would be very hard to um, live up to the first film and satisfy the really beloved fan base, but I am in love with the second film, and it takes everything you loved about the second film, the the sort of daring qualities, the visual, um, the stunning visuals, the deep relationships, and it just goes further with all of those things. And um, Dean, our writer-director, conceived it as the middle of a trilogy. So it really is, you know, extending things that were unanswered in the first film, but also setting things up to get paid off in the future. So it has a kind of big epic quality to it. It's interesting to hear that you're a fan of it because you don't often hear actors sort of say they're a fan of their own work. But do you think it's because as it's an animation, you can be kind of detached from it and then just enjoy it as a piece of cinema? Absolutely. I mean, movies like this take 400 people to put together. So when you're a voice, you're just a tiny part of of an enormous process. You're only one piece of, of, of your performance, to be honest, because I give the voice, but an animator is creating the, the, the face and the expressions and the body language. And, and so you really are such a small part of a big thing and it allows you to watch it as an outsider and, and love and appreciate all the work that went into it. So I imagine it must be quite a nerve-wracking experience because you do your bit and then you kind of leave it to all the powers that be. So you're kind of having to, you don't really know how it's going to turn out. But I guess because of the sequel, you kind of must have had so much trust in Dean with this time around. Absolutely. Um, you know, the first film was a process in figuring out what the world was going to feel like, what the characters were going to, you know, how they were going to land. It was three years of sort of trying different things with with Astrid. And so I didn't know exactly where she was going to land. It wasn't really up to me. It was really up to Dean and and, and his um, co-director on the first film, Chris Anders, and um, and the animators. So once I knew what where they landed with Astrid in the first film, then we that was just our starting point, and we could just jump off and have fun in the second film. So when you started, when you first got involved with the first film, were you aware that there could be a sequel or was it sort of, did that come about afterwards? Yeah, that, that was an afterthought. I mean, I think we didn't really know what we were making the first time around and it was really just a discovery and everyone was just trying to make the best film they could the first time around and the, the, the talk of the sequel wasn't till after the first film was out. And I, I found this film to be slightly more enlarged cinematically it had a bit more kind of battle sequences to it and stuff yeah. and I was wondering do you think that's because it's aiming at the same audience from the first one who are now sort of four years older themselves it was kind of looking to to match their sort of age so to I speak. think that's definitely an element of it in some of these epic uh you know longer stories that you you get to go on as a young person the characters age as you age you know with Hera you know I think of Harry Potter um uh I think that Dean really meant for uh, the character, it's a coming of age story. So as the characters grow older, so is our audience, but hopefully we're not leaving behind a new audience, a young audience. And I was wondering, have you ever had a, a relationship with a, a pet animal that's kind of similar to, to what Hiccup has with Toothless? Absolutely. Well, I think for me, whenever I'm in the booth and I'm talking to Astrid's dragon Stormfly or Toothless or interacting with them, it's definitely my my dog in my imagination, who's a golden retriever, and uh, and not as big or talented as a dragon, <laughs> but I love him nonetheless. Do you think that's what makes this so special? Because we've all got those uh, connections to sort of animals. Do you think that's what we can all draw, take away from this movie? Absolutely. I think everybody sees Toothless and thinks of their cat or thinks of their dog, and there are so many wonderful animal qualities. And one of my favorite moments in the second. Um, this second film is uh, when Astrid's dragon Stormfly starts playing fetch with uh, when when that wasn't when uh, Eric is throwing the kind of fire saber away and Stormfly thinks he's playing fetch. It's one of my favorite moments because my dog loves playing fetch. And uh, of course, next up we can see you in Cesar Chavez, which is uh, I saw in Berlin and I absolutely loved. Oh, great! I just wonder if Thank you could tell you. us a little bit about about that and the character you're playing. Yeah, uh, well. Um, the, the film Cesar Chavez is the first uh, film to be made of this story and the life of Cesar Chavez, who is a union labor organizer in California in the United States. And he led a huge movement for farm workers. And um, 
and I play his wife, Helen Chavez, who's still alive. She's 86, maybe 87 now. And she was a wonderful force in the movement and just an amazing woman. And um, it was an honor to get to be a part of telling this story uh, for, for people who lived it and who remember it. And also for a whole new generation that has never even really learned about him or heard him. It's a really important part of, of, of social justice history that, that really shouldn't, shouldn't disappear. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.